Welcome back, everyone. This is Faith on Fire, and I'm Brian, and this is John MacArthur. And he's going to share with you, it's about a minute clip I want to show here, how Christianity is under attack. What is, what, in what area or doctrine of Christianity is most under attack? Now, I want you to think about the different main concepts in the Bible that we attribute to Christianity, obviously faith in Jesus Christ. Is that in, under attack around the world? Is faith in Jesus Christ under attack? I'd say so. I think that's probably probably the, the main thing under attack. What about um, God's design for marriage and the family? You think the family, a godly family, that design is under attack? I would think that's been under attack for a long time. Now, this video was uploaded in 2016, so six years ago from now. But I want you to think about it in that time frame, since this was there, let's say the last decade. In what areas do you think Christianity has been under attack mostly in the last decade? I'd say the same things 10 years ago are probably the same things under attack. Some of it, maybe a little bit more so. I mean, obviously the family and so forth and God's design for marriage. You have LGBTQ like never before in everyone's face, indoctrinating kids to, in, into it all over the place. It's unbelievable. And this is an attack on Christianity and Christian values. Think about uh, cancel culture and censorship. Maybe that's a little more recent. But cancel culture and censorship of Christian values and principles is under attack, like never before. And it's hard to be on YouTube and even speak about certain biblical concepts without them considering it like hate speech or something. And people get arrested for this in other countries. I'm in the United States, so there's more freedom than other places. I'm going to share with you in a little later after this clip an article from Christianity Today that lists the top 50 most highly persecuted country, per, uh, countries that persecute Christians. And we're going to look at a list of the 10, the top 10, and I'll leave the rest for a link that anyone can go read about more. But you're going to find out what happens and how many martyrs there are every day for Christianity and some interesting things like that. Christianity is under attack. But John MacArthur has a very interesting view on what is most attacked in Christianity. And there's going to be a moral to the story here about how one, well, let me just play the clip. Here's what he says. The doctrine of total depravity, the inability and unwillingness of anyone to come to God, is the most attacked doctrine, either on purpose or ignorantly. The most attacked doctrine is the doctrine that says man can do nothing. Because every other religion in the world except true Christianity says man can and must do something. Uh, I just want to remind people that although that there is a lot of truth to that, and we cannot save ourselves, that's why we have to trust in the Savior. We can't trust in ourselves or anything else. He is the way, the truth, and the life, no question about it. But we are commanded in the Bible many, many times to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved. We must do something. Jesus said, you must be born again. I mean, there is a calling from God to do something in order to receive the gift of grace, which is eternal life. So I don't 100% agree with what he said that, uh, you know, you'll, you'll hear more what he says. But notice before I move on that the number one attack thing, of course, is Calvinism. That's the total depravity. That is a, a key tenet of Calvinism. It's distinct. It's the T in tulip. The, f the five points of Calvinism. It's the main one at the top where other things flow from. What are the other things? Total depravity and unconditional election. The idea God from the beginning of time already chose who's going to be saved and already knows, not just knows, but already chose, determined who will not be saved and go to hell. He's got his few that are the elect and the gospel is only available for them to believe and no one else will believe in it. And Jesus, this is limited atonement, the, the L and Tulip, only died for them, only came into the world to save them. No, no one else. God loves the elect, does not love anyone else. That's their doctrine. Irresistible grace, of course, is that anyone who is the elect won't be able to resist the grace offered them through the Son, Jesus Christ, at the moment of their regeneration because they've been unconditionally uh, elected. And they will persevere with the saints. So there is a works-based degree to this thing that if you're really truly elect, then it'll be evident in your walk of faith that you will persevere with the saints as opposed to persevering in the faith because of the Savior. Maybe you could call that perseverance of the Savior. I believe that. I don't believe in perseverance of the saints because that would be a man 
that would be, as he's going to say, that would be a human effort. But, eh, you know, it, it flows well for their thing. So total depravity is distinctive to Calvinism and not to anything else in Bible-believing Christianity. This idea that we are incapable of hearing the gospel and believing it and putting our trust and faith in Jesus Christ is just not realistic. It doesn't happen, and it doesn't happen that way in the Bible. That's why it says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, but Calvinists say, no, that's not true. Faith comes as a gift from God given to you as a divine download. Faith is belief in Christ, which saves you. And they say only the elect can have that, but they can only have it given by God. They cannot come to it on their own from hearing the gospel. So it becomes a divine download. Now, what is a divine download? Because you're never going to hear them use that term, because of course that sounds totally Gnostic. And it, I did that on purpose because it is Gnostic. Divine download implies God gives you knowledge in your, in your, in your head that he withholds from other people. It's a supernatural enlightening of your mind. That is withheld from other people. It comes from God, given to the elect only, not given to the others. Now, if you watch this video right here, the Gnostic Gospel of Calvinism I did, you'll see how I went through the Westminster Confession of Faith. It was not my opinion. I read what it says in chapter 10 about the effectual calling. It's about the doctrine of election. And only the elect receive what they say in their own words is the enlightening of your mind, spiritually and savingly the the understanding of the things of God. This is a divine download given only to the elect. And so this idea of being dead in sin and not being able to receive the gospel is purely a Calvinistic philosophy that is unbiblical. But he says in Christianity, that's the number one thing or doctrine that's under attack. Really? Let's listen to a little bit more. There are only two religions in the world, divine accomplishment and human achievement. Divine accomplishment is true biblical Christianity. Every other religion is some form of human achievement. The most attacked doctrine, and we heard it, it was attacked and continues to be attacked by those people who are in the progeny of, of Finney and others, the idea that man is dead, blind, helpless, hopeless that he's an eternal loser is something that men don't want to acknowledge. It is, however, the most distinctively Christian doctrine because if it is true that, that only the gospel is the truth, this is foundational to the gospel. It is the one area where you're going to find a truly distinctive view of man as totally depraved. All right, so there you have it. For those who say that... Um, the teachers of Calvinism don't marry together and link up their doctrines with the gospel. He just said total depravity is foundational to the gospel. And of course it is if you believe in their, their system. I, I, under his system, I totally believe that's correct. Because it says you're a total eternal loser who has no ability. Now, I believe that. We're all, the idea that we're good wrong we all, I, I guess those are the things he said about you know we're none of us are good and we're all eternal losers on our own that's absolutely right that's why we need a savior it doesn't mean we can't make a decision that we are an eternal loser and therefore thank you jesus for having saved us we believe in you because we're a sinner and we need a savior we can come to that conclusion when we're preached the gospel and we recognize we're a sinner in need of a savior this can resonate with us as being true, and we can believe it, but Calvinists don't, they don't buy in that. They, don't buy, they, they say, they don't, no, that's human achievement if you believe, because they always equate faith as being a work unless it's given to a person as a divine download. If you come to it in your own ability to reason like a good Berean, think, think Acts chapter 17 and verse 10, like a good Berean, and test against the scripture what you have heard, and see if the scripture is right. This is right, I believe. Then you can come and believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why Christians believe the gospel is the good news available to everyone. Because Jesus Christ came to save the world. Uh, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Calvinists don't believe that's true. The world to them is just the elect. All, everyone, the world. It's always not, not all, not everyone, not the world. Just the elect. And God has his favorites and not others. Well, anyway, 
that's not the main point of this. There'll be other videos I do where I talk, I may even play the same clip in another video where we go into their favorite story to uphold total depravity and being dead in sins and made it alive in Christ, which is Lazarus being ra risen from the dead. I have a video planned for that where I'm going to show what the real meaning in that story in gospel of the gospel of John chapter 11 is. And then I'm going to share with you another story Jesus told in the gospel that actually is the appropriate one to go to to describe someone dead in sins made alive in Christ and it tells a completely different story. The Lazarus being raised from the dead had a very specific purpose for being told in the Bible and it was that we would believe. Imagine, imagine that. The very thing Calvinists claim we cannot do is what that's written for. But right now, you're probably thinking, why am I sharing this about? Why does he think total depravity is? Understand the tactic here is to uphold and defend the Calvinist belief system. So in, in the delusional thought of a mind of a person whose only goal in ministry is to defend their philosophy and their doctrines, man-made doctrines of Calvinism, only in that would they be so blinded by their own, the stronghold in their life of this deception of this ridiculous teachings of Calvinism, totally unbiblical, would you come across in the world we live in today and say, my doctrine of my religious belief system is the number one thing being attacked in Christianity. That is the most ridiculous and foolish thing I have ever heard. And I've heard John MacArthur say some absolute crazy things. But that almost may take the cake. That he's living in a bubble called it's me and Calvinism against the world. <laughs> it's crazy. But let me explain how, how bad it gets before we get in the articles and things. We look at what's really going on in the world. Let me show you this article from Ligonier uh, Ministries. Let me set that up. Okay, so if you're, if you're not familiar with Ligonier Ministries, it's a Calvinist ministry. It was started by the late R.C. Sproul, and it keeps going, and they, and they do conferences, and they produce resources and materials. And they give an article here. What is the greatest threat to Christianity in this century? Now, you could think what it is. You might even agree with this article. But I'm going to tell you what they how This is where you got to put on the Calvinistic lens and kind of like be able to put your yourself in the shoes of another person that you don't agree with, but put, put yourself in their shoes anyway to understand what are they really saying. And if you look at it from the sense of where we're coming from, from a Bible-believing Christian perspective, this is very deceptive. Here's what they say it is. The greatest threat to Christianity in this century is, is the Christianity of this century. And some people are probably going to agree with that. Christianity, apostate churches, false teachings, this infiltration, all these things, whatever. Here's what they're very interesting. It is far greater. It's a far greater threat than Islam, which can never destroy the gospel. Remember that. They're talking about the gospel now. Christendom, however, is the highlighted part. Christendom, however, can easily destroy the gospel and is destroying the gospel. The church today is the greatest threat to real Christianity in the world. Wow. And you're probably thinking that apostate churches and other things that are, and there's plenty of examples of that, that, that they're literally talking about how Christianity is, is turning against itself and, and false teachers. And you're, you're probably thinking of maybe prosperity gospel, hyper charismatics, these prophets that are always taking trips to heaven and back. And you've heard Justin Peters do his videos and calling all these, these uh, crazies out for their, uh, their wild uh, stories and everything as if they're, they're, they're representing mainstream charismatics. And by the way, in case anyone wondered, I'm not a charismatic, but I'm, I'm not against them either. Um, you know, it's just not my, not the kind of church I go to or was raised in. So, but, uh, but I don't have an issue with, with all the charismatics I've ever come across. Yeah. There's some of the nuts, Kenneth Copeland, for instance, and some of these people that show up on Sid Roth's program, yeah, they're nuts. I, I totally agree. They, they make Christianity look bad. And they're a problem. But understand, that's not, that's not really who they're talking about. You know who they're talking about here? They're talking about you and me, the Bible-believing Christian who has put their faith and trust in the true gospel that believes that Jesus died for all and that the gospel is available to everyone if they'll put their trust in Jesus Christ to be saved. That, to a Calvinist, is a false gospel. 
That's who they think they're under attack. You understand, when Ligonier talks about the gospel, they're not talking about the gospel you and I talk, are talking about. They're talking about limited atonement, total depravity, unconditional election. This is the doctrine of election. They're talking about the gospel to them that says that, hey, you don't tell people God loves everyone, that Jesus loves everyone, that Jesus died for everyone. You don't tell them that the gospel is good news for everyone because it's not. It's only good news for the elect. Do you understand? And what is the goal of Calvinism? It apparently in recent, uh, this last decade or so, seems to be to use every sort of media possible, from internet to radio to, to YouTube to, to, to websites and, and uh, other podcasts and every platform you can think of, books uh, galore, commentaries and study Bibles. Even new Bibles, apparently. But everything possible to reach... The young, immature Christian who's looking for answers and wants to grow in Christ and has become a new believer and to divert them over to what they're going to define as Jesus and what they're going to define as uh, the gospel and what Calvinists are going to define as the work of the Holy Spirit, which is incredibly limited because most of them are cessationists. So the point is, I understand what John MacArthur is saying and what Ligonier Ministries is saying when they say our doctrine of Calvinism and our gospel is the greatest thing ever attacked because they live in a Calvinist bubble. They're so indoctrinated, that's all they see. And so the threat to them is real Christians. And not to say there aren't real Christians in Calvinism, but they have forfeited the truth of the word of God because Satan took a foothold on them when they were looking for information online or on YouTube or whatever, and they were open to the temptations of things that they shouldn't believe, but they started to look at it because they don't have the spiritual maturity or discernment to recognize how evil it is. And so they got attracted to maybe John MacArthur's teaching and started listening to him on the radio or on YouTube, and next thing you know, they're a full-blown Calvinist, indoctrinated into false doctrines, false beliefs. It's a dangerous, slippery, slippery, slippery slope going from a, a, giving Satan a foothold by entertaining the doctrines of false teachers to no longer a foothold, but a stronghold in someone's life. Calvinism is a stronghold of deception in the life of a Christian. Do they lose their salvation over that? Because now they believe the reason they were saved. They were probably saved in a non-Calvinist church who taught the real gospel. And then later got indoctrinated into Calvinism. They're a Christian despite the Calvinism. Do they lose their salvation? There are some who believe that that happens. I I personally don't. I believe they remain a a Christian. But Satan has his stronghold to keep them from really advancing the kingdom of God, telling other people the true gospel. Think about it. If you're an unbeliever and you come across a Calvinist who actually shares the gospel with you, which they may not because they may believe that God's already determined the elect and he's going to unconditionally elect and save those he will at the time he wills it to happen. So what's the point? But for those who believe the Great Commission is important and you actually do need to preach the gospel, so they do share that, more power to them. But what if they're sharing the false gospel? What if they're saying you can be saved by belief in Jesus Christ? His death on the cross, he rose from the dead. And the person says, "Is you know, I, I'm a sinner. I don't know. I don't know if I deserve that or whatever. And is, I mean, you sure that's for me? Just, just Jesus loved me too? Can I receive the free gift of grace? What is a Calvinist going to say? If they're really strictly adhering to Calvinists, they're going to say, I don't know. I really don't know if you're the elect or not. That's not my call. That's God's call. He chose from the beginning of time who's going to be saved. Maybe you're the elect. Maybe you're not. Now, what's going to happen with that unbeliever if a Calvinist is honest with them about their belief? They're not going to come away thinking that was good news and that the gospel is necessarily for them. They're going to think, it must not be for me because I know I'm a sinner and I haven't accepted Jesus yet. And so clearly that must be because God doesn't want me to. He's chosen me for wrath. Well, forget this. This is a bunch of garbage. I'm going to go look for my answers in Buddha or some other thing or mystic rocks. 
Well, with any luck, they'll find a real Bible-believing Christian who'll tell them the gospel's available to everyone, including them, and their sins are forgiven, and they can have the gift of grace because God offered it. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, and they're going to share all the whosoever passages, and they're going to share them the gospel, maybe 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, or maybe Romans 10, verse 9. Confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. Not the elect shall be saved. Maybe someone will get to that unbeliever and clarify it and they'll get saved once again by a, a real Bible-believing Christian who is not a Calvinist. Well, I said I was going to share an article now that I've kind of exposed what the real threat to Calvinism is. They're calling a threat to Christianity. It's not a threat to Christianity. It's a threat to their religious belief system that they're afraid of. Now let's look at the, uh, the article I want to share with you. Okay, here we are. Now talk about real th threat to Christianity. You know, Jesus said we'd be persecuted because of him. And here we got the 50 countries where it's most dangerous to follow Jesus in 2021. I'm not going to go through all 50, obviously. I'm going to show you the top 10 and a few statistics. Um, but I'll leave a link to this from Christianity Today in the video description if you really want to go read it in more detail. And this is just recent. It's just last year, 2021. Look, look at this. Well, John MacArthur thinks the number one attack on Christianity is the attack on the doctrine of total depravity. This one says... Every day, 13 Christians worldwide are killed because of their faith. I think that's a little more serious than me doing a video talking about how total depravity is total lunacy. right? If you want to call what I'm doing the greatest threat to Christianity because I don't agree with total depravity, fine. You're living in a delusional world that, of your own making. But the fact is the real threats out in the world against those who believe in Christ and against Christ himself, they're enemies of the cross. Every day, 12 churches or Christian buildings are attacked. And every day, 12 Christians are unjustly arrested or imprisoned, and another five are abducted. This is from the 2021 World Watch list. And there's more information that would just astound you if you go through here. But let me just scroll down real quick. I'm going to show you this thing. Where is it most dangerous to live as a Christian? I was really shocked to see uh, China not on the list. But number one, North Korea. Worst place to live. Hardest to follow Jesus is what they're saying because you, you're going to be in trouble. Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Somalia, Libya, Pakistan. Yeah, those are starting to make a lot of sense. There's a lot of martyrs there. Um, uh, Yemen, Iran, Nigeria, India. Really not, not, not a big shocker there. I just thought China would have made the list, but apparently it didn't. So anyway, you can go look at, at this uh, if you want. So, you know, in conclusion, there are real th threats to Christianity. Let me tell you one of them. Maybe the persecution around the world of Christians and the attack on Christ is one. But one of the biggest dangers to Christianity is definitely the infiltration of the Christian church by false gospels and false doctrines. And I'll, I'll put Calvinism right in there with that. So turning it back around on John MacArthur and Ligonier Ministries, no, they got it backwards. The church... And Christianity itself is not the biggest threat to Christianity. Calvinism is one of the big, I don't think it was the biggest, but it's one of the biggest threats to Christianity because it fundamentally redefines who Jesus was and what he did and who he came to save, which fundamentally changes what the true gospel is because it says the gospel is only available to the elect and not everyone. So that's not good news for everyone anymore. That's only good news for a select group of delusional people who think, despite the fact that God is no respecter of persons, they believe God loves them more than everybody else. And matter of fact, even when they start to quote Romans 9 to justify their stuff, they look at that. Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. In Romans 9, and they use that to say, God loves our group. He hates everyone else. And there it is in the Bible, a gross misinterpretation of Romans 9. So there you have it, everyone. I hope that you found that interesting. Thanks for watching. Next couple videos on this uh, Calvinism, I think is going to be some light bulb moments for people. It's going to be really incredible. And I hope you'll stick around and watch. And I'm looking forward to doing the next couple videos. So I can give you more information about th what they're going to be about. But... I like, I like leaving a little bit of mystery there. So thanks for watching and may the peace and love of Jesus Christ be with you now and forever. Amen. Bye-bye. I'll see you real soon in the, in the next video. Bye-bye.